Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick, and this is a show about Canadian culture and the way it informs this nation's history. On this episode, we're going to be changing the format up a bit, but not exactly the content. We're going to be covering a historical moment through a piece of literature, as usual, and a rather important one at that. But what has changed for today is that I actually have a guest. So before I introduce him properly, just go into this episode knowing that it will be a bit more of a free-flowing discussion instead of a concretely organized episode like I've been doing since the beginning. Without further ado, I will introduce you to one of my dear friends, someone who I met during my time as an undergraduate at Concordia, the person who sat through the entirety of Cats with me. He is a lover, not a fighter. He's a reader, not a breeder. And someone who I've been talking with about being on the show for a while now, and whose insight into literature I'm very excited to hear, even if his opinion turns out to be utter garbage. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mackenzie Cooper. How are you, Mac? I'm doing okay. Thanks for the wonderfully, delightfully nice intro. <laughs> Did it a appear too kinder. scripted? <laughs> Oh no no no! I don't know. I don't. I don't have a script, so I can't say for sure. I don't know if you're hiding a script from me, but that's all good. <laughs> I, I was writing <laughs> "reader, not a breeder." I was like, "This is gold." <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, you do have a script. Okay. Uh, I I had a script just for the intro, or else I falter too much, and there's too many uhs, mm's. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Exactly. So I just wanted uh -huh. it to be a bit more free flowing, and now I'm breaking the entire thing. <laughs> That's fine. It's fine. fine. But um, no, I don't. I, usually I have a script for the show, but uh, this time I just made a series of notes about vague ideas for where we could maybe take this. That works. But if not, uh, you know, for like sure. I said, free flowing. It's fine. Everything's fine. The world isn't burning. The, yeah. And then the people can let us know what they think. That way, if they want me back, I can come back. Or if yep. they prefer just you, that's fine too. I'm fine being disliked. It's okay. I don't have an inferiority complex. Everything's all right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, before we get started, how about you tell us a bit about yourself? What's your background in literature? What are you most interested in? Or more specifically for this show, what's your interest in Canadian literature or history, if any? Well, as far as Canadian literature goes, I've mostly stumbled accidentally in becoming like somebody who's read a lot of Canadian literature. As we all do. Yep. Well, yeah. So... Because it starts out, you have like those introduction classes that you have to do at university, you know, for literature. Mm -hmm. And then my first one, and the prof, when they go in, the prof decides the course content, right? For those courses, because they're not really set content. They just have a vague idea of what they have to teach you. So my professor for my introductory introduction to literature class was a Canadian literature specialist. So that's what we read and what we studied. And then that got compounded with, in Concordia, you have to do a certain amount of Canadian literature classes. So I did a couple more of those. And then I took some other sort of like critical reading classes and things like that. And it was the same professor from my intro courses. So that was more Canadian literature. That it's I had just everywhere. I was just, it was just everywhere. And then for my sort of other courses, one of my friends got me to take a Montreal in Quebec literature class. So I think that's about five or six Canadian lit classes. And only two of them were supposed to be Canadian lit. The others were all just intro classes that got like shifted into that content. Forced into it. Yeah. I have a lot more Canadian literature on my shelves than I really wanted to have. But right? now here I am, you know, I, I think I've done almost like half a minor's worth of Canadian literature, probably that, more. That's pretty funny. Like, I think I've taken less Canadian literature classes than you have. <laughs> but you probably know a lot more about it than I do. I, I don't know. Like, it's just... Because uh, that interest has been more in my personal life for a long time. Like mm -hmm. uh, for Concordia, I was in English and history. I didn't have an obligation to take specifically right. Canadian literature classes. But mm -hmm. that interest, so that interest kind of developed personally. And once I was in my master's, I, I kind of found an opportunity to really develop that more concretely within an academic uh, world. But mm -hmm. In my undergraduate, the only time that I actually had a Canadian literature class was with Professor O'Leary, which was right, right, right. like one semester at the beginning of my undergraduate. And that's the only time. 
<laughs> I had a class with O'Leary, and then I was so it was supposed to be Canadian literature from 1950 to 1980. Yep. I think the first half of it was pre 1950 literature. That makes a lot of sense. Like he does not care. <laughs> he, no, because he's an expert in 19th century Canadian literature, so he'll talk about well, that as much. As... And then, well, because then my other. Canadian lit class I was taking that same semester was with Catherine McLeod, who is phenomenal, but she's a more modern Canadian lit, and she was supposed to be the pre-1950 literature professor, and so content and topic basically got reversed a bit. That wasn't confusing at all. No, so post-1950, I was studying pre-1950, and pre-1950, I was studying post-1950, when really, all I really like to do is read plays yeah. in my academic reading. I prefer the plays, all of that sort of fun stuff, but here I am with too much knowledge of Canadian literature and nothing to do with it. Okay, so did you read any plays actually in any of those classes? I did in the Montreal lit one. It was Angelica, I believe is the name of it. Okay. I think that was just the only like play from a Canadian lit standpoint that I read. There might've been others, but that must've been the only one that stood out. And so was your interest or at least uh, have the classes that you've taken been more 20th century in the end? Like I know the the two you mentioned kind of flipped around, but in general, is it more of a modern Canadian sensibility that you're, that you've been looking at or, or that you had looked well, at? Well, that's just it with Canadian literature. Like if you're really going to look at Canadian literature, it's going to be a 20th century sensibility. Mm -hmm. Like for the, for the most part, if you're, this is just my opinion, mind you, and I know that's going to conflict with what we're going to be talking about today. But, <laughs> like, Canada started with the BNA Act. So, for that, and that's when the literature became distinctly Canadian. And to me, stuff like in that pre sort of sensibility is Canadian colonial or colonial Canadian, not so much strictly Canadian in that sense, you know? Okay. I have issues with what you just said. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. I could be talking on my ass. I'm not an expert. No, no, no. But like, that's an opinion that you can definitely argue for. And I see where you're coming from. Of like, this is when Canada became a state in and of itself. Like, that's a totally fair mm -hmm. argument to make. Um, like, I, could, I would still consider the clockmaker part of the Canadian canon. Okay. But see, that's interesting because the author himself, I don't think he would have considered himself as part of that canon. No. Well, he's, he's English, isn't he? But he was born in Nova Scotia, but right. he very much, like you say, a lot of pre-British uh, North America Act, for, for our listeners who don't know what Mackenzie was referring to when he said BNA Act, but... Um, yeah. uh, My bad. For, no, 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 it's fine. For like pre-British North America Act, a lot of the literature was very much tied to colonial sentiments, right? And logically so, it makes sense that that would happen there was a lot of uh, propaganda and instilling of those values into the people that were here, right? It would make sense that that's mm -hmm. a recurring theme, but there's nevertheless some ideas that are formative during that period that kind of make their way into a more modern area. And I think we are oh, for sure. Yeah. I think we'll be able to talk about a few of those here, but before that, I know what the British North America Act is, or does that need a bit of context? So the British North America Act was uh, in 1867. It was the document. It was our Declaration of Independence, yeah. except instead of waging a war, we went to Britain, asked politely, and they said yes. Exactly. And they, gave us, right? they gave us permission to statehood. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get to that eventually in the chronology of the show. We're not quite there yet because I'm trying to keep a chronological fair uh, feel to it. Like, that's fair. But you, you, you bring up a good point. Like, we just kind of asked for it. Like you said, we didn't really go to war there were some rebellions, which I've been leading up to and that are mentioned in this book we're going to talk about today, which by the way, if you haven't read the title of this episode, we're talking about Thomas Chandler Halliburton's 1836 comedy called The Clockmaker or The Sayings and Doings of Sam Slick of Slickville. A long title. It's a mouthful, but Sam you know. Sam Slick of Slickville. Sam Slick of Slickville. Yeah, exactly. Quite a tongue twister. Tongue twister. <laughs> Damn it. But um, yeah, I, sh I maybe should have introduced that in the first minutes, but it doesn't matter. For those of you who want to read it, it's free on the Gutenberg project. Yeah. So you can look at it there if you want to take a look at it later. So yeah, we're talking about this book today. And the reason why we're kind of talking about a bit more of a colonial context is because this is really steeped or Halliburton really wants to accentuate 
the relation between the colonies and the empire in and of itself. And mm-hmm. which is, as we'll talk about, hopefully something that's less and less of a popular opinion as the 1830s roll around and is kind of going to go through some waxing and waning as the decades go around. So yeah, I guess I can ask you another question, Mac, is what's your knowledge or what kind of ideas do you have about Canada or at least the colonies? Because as you mentioned, it wasn't really Canada. It was just known as British North America, if you want to refer to all the colonies together. The specific area would be like upper and lower Canada was like that main chunk. And then there's the maritime colonies, right? Yeah, exactly. So you would have had Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, PEI, and New Brunswick were there, but they, everything was essentially a separate colony. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And they, they didn't refer to themselves all together as Canada. It was altogether yeah. British North America, but we're our own separate colonies with our own governments. Yeah, for sure. That's about the gist of what I understand from it. Okay. From yeah. what I remember from my high school education. Right. So a, a bit of context for when Halliburton is writing and who Halliburton is actually. So right around this time in the 1830s, we had these kind of Republican sentiments that were forming, if you will, in Canada. And I mean Republican in the sense, not of the political party, but of this idea of creating a state that is more independent, right? That has elected officials. This is at a moment in Canada where we're seeking a bit more responsible government and officials that represent actually the body of citizens, right? That aren't just chosen by the colonial administration that is an ocean away. And Halliburton is not a fan of this, as we're going to see many times in the book. He does not care for it in the slightest, because Halliburton is what would be called at the time a Tory, which is an old word for a conservative. And on top of that, he was an old style of conservative. He was a conservative conservative. (laughs) It's really kind of interesting. So in that sense, he's very attached to the British system of monarchy, and he believes that the best way for uh, the colonies to prosper is under the empire. And so as the 1830s roll around, and that especially in the Canadas, there are these increasingly strong sentiments to gain responsible government, you'll have this pushback from people like Halliburton that says, no, this is rebellious talk. This is revolutionary talk that has no place in British North American society. And so when this book comes out, though, the rebellions haven't happened yet. And we're going to have whole episodes on the rebellions, but broadly speaking, they're going to be essentially the boiling over point in Upper and Lower Canada, uh, although they will be seen as slightly differently in both provinces. It's mostly just in the the more French, from France province. Right. And their fear is less about independence, more about assimilation. But Very much so, right? It's, it's more accentuated, definitely, in, in Lower Canada, in the French-speaking province, because you see greater divides, right, between the rich and the poor, the French and English. So it's easier to criticize that form of government mm-hmm. when there's so, there are so cultural clear divide. distinctions. Right, and cultural divides, exactly. But there's still some agitation in Upper Canada, but as Mackenzie said, it's really not as obvious, if you will, or not as major. Mm-hmm. What was happening in the Maritimes? Did they rebel at the same time? Or? So that's the thing, is that no. The Maritimes have been kind of this, I don't want to say boring, but there was a bit of agitation. They did also call for responsible government, but mm-hmm. especially in Nova Scotia, there was just this kind of acceptance that through debate, through actual discussion within what limited parliament there was that was was an elected body, you could actually advance some change. If only, if only. Yeah, if only, if only. But you say that, but funny enough, they actually received responsible government before the Canadas that rebelled. Right. So so Nova Scotia got it the same year, but they got it a bit before and they did it without doing much. (laughs) There was a bit of agitation, but it wasn't on the level of rebellions that were seen in the 1830s. It's, it's just how it works for Canada. We just work by, you know, asking and being polite. <laughs> rebellion's not really our thing. Right. And even as we'll see in the later episodes is that even when we do rebel, 
let's face it, they were going up against the British Empire, man. <laughs> like, what were you expecting okay, but, was going to happen? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they were writing the fact the Americans went up against the British Empire and won somehow. They won somehow because the French helped them. That's true. That's, yeah. that is, that's true. But um, that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> yeah, we're not here to talk Hamilton. Oh, my God. I still want to see that. But it's on Disney+. Plus. I don't have Disney+. Plus. I refuse to kowtow to our overlords at Disney. Okay. Have your little pointless rebellion. Oi, I'm going to accept my destiny as a Canadian and do every pointless rebellion that I can, okay? Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's a big part of the context uh, before going in. So there's some movement in the Canadas, in the Maritimes, less so. Also an important point to note, especially about the Maritimes, and as you'll see, we're going to be talking a lot about the Maritimes today because that's where the book is set, is that it was still very much a rural and conventional economy. It is very much still based in agriculture and farming, and it hadn't really developed that much of an industrial economy yet, with the most industrial part of it being shipbuilding. And that's something, once again, that's going to come up in uh, The Clockmaker and that we might get to uh, later on, but I just want to set the context for that. So Nova Scotia is not that big of an economy in terms of the grand scheme of British North America, but at least it is seeing some development, especially in shipbuilding, because Halifax is one of the entryways into the entire continent, right? It's one of and the important parts. And that's just the British mentality of building ships, strong Navy, all that fun stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. They were the biggest Naval power on the planet at that point, right? They had to kind of, they were, them. yeah. All the way up till world war one, basically. Yep. Right around the time when the empire started to collapse. Spoiler alert. Spoiler yeah. alert. We invented planes. So boats became kind of obsolete. Yep. There you go. Anyway, but I think that can kind of lead us into who Halliburton himself was. And Mac, you had mentioned before we started recording that you had looked into a bit as to who he was. Do you want to say a bit about him or do you want me to keep going? I can say a little bit. I can take my turn, give your voice a rest. Just so I don't feel like I'm monologuing at someone. Yeah. Well, everything that I learned was basically that he, as well as being an author, he was more known being a politician and a judge. Yeah. Starting out in Nova Scotia. But eventually he just moved to England, became a member of the Conservative Party, and his his son became more famous people. Apparently Lord Halliburton, anthropologist Robert Grant Halliburton, he just set up a dynasty of Halliburtons in England. So yeah. really this guy, just from looking at the basics, does not identify in that way of Canadian. Doesn't no. seem to have any ties to his home, his place of birth, his homeland or anything like that. He just stayed there for a little bit and then he buggered off yep that's pretty much the basic gist of who Halliburton is what's interesting is that through the clockmaker he's kind of arguing very broadly for certain changes to happen in Nova Scotia and he clearly takes it mm -hmm. to heart but as you mentioned he ends his life in what he would have called back home in Britain right mm -hmm. um, even if he was born in Halifax but he increasingly became disenfranchised by Nova Scotia as the decades wore along and as they gained responsible government and as they went into a direction that he wasn't necessarily interested in. And so he would maintain his old conservative values and just bugger off, as you say, to England where he would die remembered as being this old style conservative. But, enough, I'm just looking at more background info on him. Yeah. He was a big proponent of immigration. Yes. In Nova that's, Scotia. That's what I was going to come up with is that there's kind of these contradictions with Halliburton. So as we've mentioned many times, he was a big proponent of an old style of government, but there were certain policies that he was kind of progressive on. And so uh, you mentioned immigration, obviously, or not so obviously necessarily, this is a very specific type of immigration. Because one of the things you texted to me, um, which I thought was very interesting before the show, was, huh, he uses the N-word a lot in yeah. his book. And that's in part a product of 
the time, but it's also indicative of the man's sentiments towards non-European uh, or oh, what they sure. would have considered non-white European people, right? Like when he's saying he's proponent of immigrants, he's mostly just saying he's proponent of like British people coming over here so they can strengthen the British North America for yes. the rest of England and the English empire. It's not for the benefit of British North America. It's for the benefit of the mother country. Oh yeah, very much so. So like, uh, it's not really being a proponent of immigrants. He's a proponent of quote unquote proper immigrants. Mm -hmm. I cannot stress enough how big these air quotes are for people who are listening. <laughs> it's again, very much this mindset of a British centric uh, North America. Mm -hmm. But there were certain places in which he was kind of progressive. So for example, e. Mackenzie, you mentioned that he was a judge. And within his role as a judge, he would often be a, a vocal proponent of a bit more leeway in terms of social hierarchy and kind of moving up the social ladder, but still maintaining a really educated and British elite. Right? So mm -hmm. kind of what we would understand today as a lower and middle class, they, those people were allowed to move and be a bit freer but the governing classes would have definitely been much more British. Or for example, he was in favor of common schools, uh, like a common idea of schools throughout the colonies to really create this better educated population. So yeah, things like that, that don't really permeate within the clockmaker, but uh, mm -hmm. that were definitely a part of his mindset. You did mention his son, or was it his grandson, R.G. Halliburton, Robert? Yes, Robert yeah. Grant. Robert Grant. So Robert Grant would actually be would actually return to Canada, and he would actually form. And this is a complete tangent; it has nothing to do with the book or anything. But I just thought it was an interesting oh. thing to to mention. He would actually return and be a part of a group called Canada First, which is a weird group to say the least. English and Canadian society as heirs of the Aryan Northmen and that the French Canadians were a bar to progress. Yes. So he was part of what some historians have called Canadian imperialism. Not imperialism in the sense of seeing Canada as an empire in and of itself, but as a greater part of the empire, of the British mm -hmm. empire. And some reasons that they would go about this is, as Mac just said, by expounding some of what they saw as the quote-unquote better aspects of Canada, right? So the non-French ones. Non-French, very British-centric, very much anti-American, and really trying to exacerbate Canada on an international scale and have it be a greater part of the British Empire, or at least a more prominent part of it. Mm-hmm. And I think that can kind of segue us into the general topic for today, which is, as we mentioned, the clockmaker, because a lot of those themes are present in the clockmaker. Halliburton would have talked specifically about Nova Scotia, but this idea of it being a greater part of the empire and really pointing to specific ideas that he wanted to elaborate on and that he wanted to propose as being more concentrated on in Nova Scotia to make it a better place. This is me gr very much exaggerating, or at least simplifying what the book is about, but I think it kind of gets us onto topic. Oh, yeah. So before I let you speak, Mackenzie, and have you tell me what you thought of the book, briefly for the people who wouldn't have necessarily read The Clockmaker, because it's almost 100 years old at this point, so why would you have, unless you're a Canadian history nerd like I am? <laughs> And it's um, incredibly thick. This book, as we mentioned, is called The Sayings and Doings of Sam Slick of Slickville. Right? That's the he's the titular clockmaker. And Sam Slick is a very stereotypical American who oh, yeah. many people think is uh, Halliburton's alter ego, or one of Halliburton's egos in this book. And the whole book is basically a series of sketches. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not really a connected story. There isn't really a through line. There's not a character arc that anyone really goes through. It's a series of sketches that are meant to be comedies and satires that explore Sam Slick, this American clockmaker in Nova Scotia. 
and his interactions with the narrator called the Squire, who is Nova Scotian or British, depending on your interpretation. Some people see him as British. Yeah. Well, the um, sort of pang- on the official Penguin and Clubhouse reading site or whatever it says, Yankee clock peddler and visiting English gentleman. There the Squires. You go. Yeah. So he's British. Cool. Yeah. Well, that seems to be the identification. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the point is they're in Nova Scotia and the whole book, this comedy, is basically a way for Halliburton to work through some of his ideas about Nova Scotia. And he works through those ideas by having Sam Slick and the Squire discuss various topics about Nova Scotia, about America, and about the British. That's very briefly what happens and they basically do that for 200 pages. So Mackenzie, Oh, mm-hmm. once again, shut up because I monologue a lot. That's what fine. do you think of the clockmaker? Um, I'm not as super invested in analysis as you are of the clockmaker, but from what I have read, it's there's some funny bits to it, but it all seems a bit. It comes off as a bit, I guess, with hindsight and my own Canadian bias showing, as a bit misguided, or he doesn't fully grasp the situation. You know. His writings comes off as very much the English man trying, looking down on the little people in the mud and trying to tell them of what they can do better without realizing that it's not really a choice for them to do. That being said, he does do some funny stuff with wordplay. He uses interchangeable words. For example, when he's talking about the bank, but he uses instead the, the idea of like a river bank and a real bank. That's sort of interesting uh, interchange between the rural word and then the urban word. And I find that's actually really cool that he does that. It's a very interesting way of setting up these expectations and sort of setting up the environment that he's in. Mm -hmm. Very much so. One of the things that the first time I read it, because at this point I think I've read it like six times, (laughs) Um, for those of you who, who, who don't know because I wasn't recording there, this is actually the book I'm writing my master's thesis on. So I read it way too much, but I found it moralistic in a sense. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the, episodes or a lot of the chapters as you say it's kind of like he was an mp he was a judge and it very much comes across as this elite man looking down upon lesser classes or lower classes if you will and telling them what to do and it very much comes off even when he's not talking about that as him being the ultimate resource here telling people what to do and it's extremely moralistic to me and I think that's the problem with what he's, because he's trying to make a moralistic satire. Mm-hmm. And those things, that's, a, that's a bit oxymoronic, you know? You don't, satire is supposed to, it's, it's supposed to show the flaws with the system and all that, but it's not exactly what you think of when you think moralistic. It's not exactly what you think of when you're trying to see what's like the true way of doing something better, you know? Satire is not exactly what comes to mind. And especially as a kid, I find it's strange for upper class to do satire on the lower class. Because the whole point of satire is for the lower class to poke fun at the higher ups and sort of show the problems that exist within this higher class and upper class society. I mean, if you look at my big basis for satire, of course, is going to be the British plays of satirical plays in the Restoration period. Mm -hmm. And these low common writers moving up to poke fun at the high nobility the lords and ladies of the land. And that's the fundamentals of satire for me. Is It's a method for low common born people to fight back and poke fun. So for a high noble man who's a judge, a politician in this Nova Scotia to then use satire, it seems like it's the wrong method to use in this situation. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. I hadn't thought of that. I, I've given thought to the satirical elements, but I haven't given much thought to the the way he goes about it, or at least the, the, the intent behind the satire, or just mm-hmm. the validity of that satire. That's actually a very interesting point. And I don't know if it's because Halliburton himself, despite being a politician, as I mentioned, did have some progressive ideas, and he saw himself somewhat as a defender of the people in certain situations. Yeah, he seems very savior-oriented. Mm-hmm. And in the book, this kind of comes across but just in his political life in general right helping out lower and middle class people but again there's these this is very much this dichotomy of being upper class but helping the lower i i I, i'm just working i'm stumbling through this because it's a very good point and i haven't really thought about it but yeah i I like it i just to me it just seems to be you know if if you are the upper class and you want to help the lower class you don't 
tell them how to do it. You're, you're in the position of power. You already mm-hmm. have the power to make the change. This is very much a man who is in power. So you shouldn't be telling people how to make changes. He has the power to do it himself. The point of satirical authors is the fact that they don't have the power to do it, but they can inform the people with the power what kind of change they should be making. And that's the problem with this dichotomy is that he sees himself as like all the other satirical writers, but he's not. He's already in the position of power where he can affect the most change in these situations. Yeah, he can affect the most change, but also from a Nova Scotian point of view, is he that much in a position of power? So for example, no. he, he's still mm-hmm. in the colony. And that's something mm-hmm. that he's very much railing against in this book is just how little the colonies do get representation for various reasons. So right. I think that's a part of where the validity of his satire comes from is that the motherland, which he very much uh, uh, likes in many respects, and he's very much infatuated by this idea of the British empire. And he believes that it's the better way to go about living. I think there's still something to be said about him being a part of the colony, or at least at the time that he was writing the clockmaker and criticizing the way that they are treated. He wants it to be much more of an elite or much more of a, a higher class system or place. I, I lost the train of thought that I was going for. Damn it. Well, <laughs> but you see I, what I'm I going what for, you're right? Saying, yeah. And you can definitely see it in the very opening sketch. For those of you who don't know, the opening sketch is Sam Slick is riding on his horse. Sam Slick is from Connecticut. He's riding on his horse that he believes has always been the fastest. He races against other people at a challenge. And so he races it against this Nova Scotian Englishman. And the Nova Scotian Englishman on his horse wins the race. And you can see this inherent belief that Thomas does have for the potential. We are the fast racehorse in that analogy. You know, his colony is the potential of the fast versus the American racehorse. So I think there's a very important distinction to be made in that the Canadian racehorse won. And I do believe he still believes in his colony. I just believe he's going about it the wrong way of writing satire for change. And I do find it interesting because you can also read a lot into the fact that this is 1830 something. So America has been its own nation at this point. So you can make the belief that he believes that the Nova Scotian colony tied to the mother nation has a much stronger chance and potential than the fully independent American nation does. That's an excellent point. And this is not the only place in the book where he mentions that. I think like there's a few chapters and they're easy to point to because the chapters are very aptly named. So like, so yeah, he, he says that in the trotting horse, Mr. Slick's opinion of the British. uh, He mentions that in that chapter also a Yankee Mm -hmm. handle for a Halifax blade. All these ideas that you just mentioned come up, but one word, a specific word that you mentioned that I really want to poke at that I found was a great choice was potential. Um, So throughout the text, despite the fact that Halliburton is very critical of the Americans, Sam Slick is supposed to be a parody of the ultimate capitalist. He's supposed to be a parody of this person who wants money above most things, right? And kind of is very much enamored by this nostalgic war-like vision. And he mm-hmm. re- references Washington, for example. Like He's the ultimate stereotype of Americans. And while they're right. not all true, it's the idea that many of us in, st- in satirizing the Americans will go for. Now, he's very critical of the British as well. But again, coming back to this idea of potential is that while he's critical of these two major powers which the United States was already well on its way to becoming by 1836. He doesn't say that Nova Scotia is the perfect balance between the two, right? It still has its issues. And I think that's where his greatest criticism of the book comes from. While he is very much critical of both powers, of all three powers, of the colonies, of the British, of the Americans, he thinks that everyone can learn from that in order to make... Nova Scotia a greater place. But he thinks Nova Scotia can be better. Yes, exactly. By taking elements of the Americans, they can take their go-getting spirit and their will to develop economically much more actively. And they can take the the moral high ground that the British represent to Halliburton. Uh Anyway, I just thought that was an interesting point, potential that you brought up. Yeah, well, because you can 
definitely see his favor towards the American in the fact that Sam Slick is an American. And although he is a parody, he is the one who's pointing out what he sees are the flaws in his inner monologue and all that. He's the one who's pointing out to see they can do this different, they can do that differently. So obviously Halliburton has some respect for what's going on in the American colonies. He just believes that combining it with the British sensibilities can take it that much further. Yeah. Which is something you find a lot, I find, in Canadian literature, especially like early 20th century and then in this time period, is that you find this idea that because we're a combination of these different cultures, almost we have the potential to be so much greater. Mm-hmm. And you see Thomas is definitely tapping into that sentiment. Definitely. I think even a few times during the the book, he refers to Americans as the cousins, like that. There, there's very much that relation that they come from the same place in a sense, but they're going on different paths. And that path mm-hmm. for Canada, at least for Nova Scotia, is very much a more British path. Yeah. And it's a very defining time for Canada in a cultural sense in the 1830s, because now you have the distinctly American culture in the South, the distinctly British culture that is their colonies and then the original French culture. And in this time period, like, again, you can see the fact there's rebellions in that. Only, what, 20 years after Thomas Halliburton releases this, we get the BNA Act in 67. Yeah. So you can see this, and before this, everybody's worried about the encroaching American culture, the encroaching American machine. You can see these people all fighting to figure out what they're trying to figure out, what, what it means to be who they are. And I think Thomas is just throwing his, his two cents in, which is fair enough, you know? Fair enough to throw in your own opinion. What do you think about his opinion that Nova Scotia is completely distinct from the other colonies, right? Do you think that would have been something that would have held ground? Do you think that his points are valid? Or do you think it was kind of inevitable that considering the similar destiny or similar paths that many of the British North American colonies were going on, that they were kind of destined to join together, even in their differences against American encroachment with the British flavor. Do you, so do, you, do you buy into his point, basically, that Nova Scotia is different? Are you asking different? me that, right, that Nova Scotia is, I mean, yeah, but that's just a general thing you could say about any place, though. Any place sure. is different from the other, you know? Even between, like, say, the most British colonies of the Canadas, upper and lower Canada, night and day, almost, you know? And then, so, I don't know if Nova Scotia would have been able to stand on its own, but I am willing to say it would have been, it's its own separate place. Like it has, its, I, I haven't been to Nova Scotia, but from everything I've heard from Nova Scotians, it's a, it has its own distinct culture, even within the, the maritime contingency, I guess. Yeah, I would, I would tend to agree. Although I would be a bit more willing to, to focus on the similarities, especially at that time. I, I would agree mm-hmm. that today there, the distinctions have been kind of accentuated between the provinces for a variety of factors the provinces of Canada have kind of gone into their own identitarian directions and that's cool. That's true. But um, at the time, at the time they would have been similar. I get that. Sure. The upper and lower Canada were a bit more rowdy according to Halliburton. (laughs) If you want to agree with that, I'm all for the rebellions, like good on them. They got, they got responsible government (laughs) eventually. Do what you want. Yeah. Right. Um, But Also, and this I found kind of interesting, and this kind of brings it back to his progeny, Robert Grant Halliburton, would have been very much, and it kind of brings it full circle to how we started this conversation, would have proposed similar ideas, but for Canada as a whole. So Grant Halliburton would have existed or would have created Canada First, his movement in the 1880s and 1890s. So well into Confederation, and you still see these ideas kind of permeating of their path, or at least the vision that they, that these people had, was of a Canada that was very British-centric, despite the French element, and that was distinct from the American culture, but that had its own path to go with. And so I don't know how to come to terms with, and I guess that's one of the questions that we can ask ourselves, is how do we come to terms with the fact that what applied for so specifically for Nova Scotia, for Halliburton, applied almost as well to Canada 60 years later or 70 years later, at least in the limited understanding that they wanted to force as many British values onto all of Canada and ignore the 
minute differences that made up each of those provinces. I don't know if that's a clear question. Well, there was a question in there? <laughs> no, it was more like a thought. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I think it's inevitable that sort of Canada would be- end up banding together in some shape or form. Again, I think that's just sort of what the mentality is in this, in when they were, you know, colonizing the new world, as they right. called it. You just had a tendency to band together. And if they weren't going to band together to the south because they didn't want to be part of the American machine, it would make sense that they would reach out eastward or westward or whichever way they were reaching out to each other. And this is something that we haven't mentioned, but I think is an important factor in the endurance of these ideas and their transference from simply being a provincial thing to a statewide thing, a nationwide thing, is that this book was kind of a bestseller in its time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't know if you found that in your research, but basically this was the first Canadian bestseller. Yeah, that is one of the, he was the first international best-selling author of fiction from Canada. Yeah. Which like, is kind of crazy. It's it's really crazy, right? <laughs> this this guy who for all intents and purposes has had these really old ideas, even though they would return later on as we've just established, kind of convinced people from across the British Empire to buy into his book and buy into his ideas. So it must have hit a chord somewhere with with people because very few books have that kind of success if there isn't something that people can kind of get behind oh for sure and the fact that it is a bestseller speaks to how people people must have agreed with his opinion in some way shape or form yep. and you can't it's because i mean as much as we tend to look aside from the popular these days and disregard the popular as being important or having something to say if the people are behind it it must have something that is that is saying to them. Yep. If that makes any sort of my words didn't jumble two together on that point. No, no, I I, I totally get it. Like people are latching on to something, right? Mm-hmm. And well, it's I also think... it's go ahead. The clockmaker has a larger reflection of what we ended up doing in Canada because he's not calling for revolution in his book at all. He's mostly no. just saying we can work with our mother country to improve upon things and to find a good way of doing these things with Sam Slick, the American parody boy, showing us what needs to be done. And that's basically what Canada has done in its long history is basically found a way to, you know, ask originally, again, we joked about it at the beginning, but we asked to be our own state. We found these ways of doing this peaceful sort of through debate, like Thomas Chandler Holland Burton wants us to do through debate, discussion, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So obviously he was onto something. I, I kind of want to keep going on this point though of it being a bestseller because people legitimately talked about this book, right? It stirred emotions. And it, this kind of comes back to the point of satire that we were making at the beginning. Satire being obviously a way to get people to talk about things and think about the world around them, obviously through comedy or through exaggeration of certain traits. But as much as people were clearly buying this, and were interested, there were also naturally some people who were really against it. Oh, of course. I've been, I've been reading a lot of criticism of the book at the time, and both Nova Scotians and Americans really railed against this book for a while. <laughs> so when like, you say it was a bestseller, what was it, where was it selling? It was selling England? Yeah, a lot in England, a lot in, a lot in Canada. There was even a whole thing about piracy in the United States. Like this book was pirated decades before Pirate Bay, we have the OG Canadian (laughs) piracy book. (laughs) God. Um, Yeah, there was like some kind of uh, rights mix up and it ended up being pirated in a few countries, which certainly helped for its success, uh, Mm, unfortunately. If something's being pirated, that means people want it that bad. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Like people were not necessarily on board with it. And I think it's kind of interesting that despite being critical of the ideas advanced in it, like you say, a lot of the ideas kind of came true in the way that Canada developed. Mm -hmm. And there's something to be said about, you know, Nova Scotians reacting against uh, the fact that he kind of calls them out as being a vapid province that doesn't have that much of an industry that doesn't have a culture that, well, that has a culture, but that they're not expounding it a lot. And Americans being critical of the fact that they're being depicted as warmongering capitalists (laughs) <laughs> they kind of are, but whatever. 
yeah, sure. But I'm, I'm again, they, they were not happy about being so blatantly no. depicted as such. Um, no. But there's still something to be said about this book to get people moving and talking. And I think that's where the power of his satire kind of amounts to. Mm-hmm. So you were mentioning at first that, you know, it's kind of ironic that he's a member of the upper class and still criticizing a lot of people. It seems kind of antithetical to the point of satire. And yet a lot of this book really hits home a lot of the things that satire is trying to do. That is get people mm-hmm. to reflect on themselves and change accordingly, or at least adapt according to the criticisms that they have received through that satire. Well, no, if he accomplished his goal, then obviously he works in satire. Like, if you do it, if it works and it's stupid, it ain't stupid, you know? And so obviously this, but that's what this man has accomplished. The Luke group, I was there saying at the beginning that it's a weird kind of satire, but it's still satire then. And if it does exactly what it sits out to do, can you really argue with that result? You know, and I don't really think you can. Certain people, like, you might debate its validity as satire, but it accomplished the same goal. No matter what it actually turned out to be, it accomplished his goal of what he wanted his satire to do. I have a feeling, and I don't know how much of other type of comedic books you've read in the Canadian quote-unquote canon. I have so much problems with that phrase. But yeah, me too. I hate it. But it's, it's like a, it's a useful shorthand yeah. for, for, for what we're talking about. But yeah, I guess. This kind of satire kickstarted things in Canada also, like as a form. Mm-hmm. Um, so later on, especially as the 20th century would roll around, we would get many more writers and thinkers that would use this similar type of criticism or writing style. You had people like Stephen Leacock, who's kind of a famous satirist who would kind of adopt many of these tropes or ways of writing also and and would do so on an equally popular basis. And so I think there's something to say also about the fact that his vehicle for writing itself became so popular that not only his ideas, but his method of disseminating those ideas passed down from generation to generation. And I would certainly think that helped in the clockmaker being returned to over and over again as a text. Oh, for sure. It's a pioneering text. Exactly. And despite all its issues and its blatant conservatism and advocation that slavery should be allowed to continue, which we haven't really talked about. um, But That is some triangle trade shit right there. Oh, big time. Do you want to talk that, about that for a minute or no? Like, I don't know what, what to say. What honestly. the triangle trade is? Sure. Right. Or just about his opinions about it. I don't know if there's much to talk about there. It's just, he's kind of racist, <sighs> very racist. Yeah. And, oh yeah. And that's definitely something that is, is a talking point, especially in the modern time of where we are right now. Yeah. Especially as Canadians around the world grapple with the fact of our racist past and history. I mean, this guy is a perfect example because here we are saying that he had some good ideas speaking on what towards Canada ended up becoming and his ideas did come to fruition. But he's got a bit of a checkered past. And I'd say that in like, I say checkered, he was racist. Oh, yeah. And so that, that's something we have to grapple with. But to go to the original point of what the triangle trade is, for those who have no idea what I mean when I say that, it's basically the idea of there was three points on the map of trade. You had the mother nation, which would then send its boats down to Africa, which would pick up slaves and then take it to the colonies. And in the colonies, they would manufacture the raw goods. So the slaves go to the slaves go to the colonies, harvest all the raw goods, raw goods go from the colonies back to the mother nation, which then turns the raw goods into manufactured goods, which it can then sell for profit, which then helps the colonies, et cetera, et cetera. And that used to be the default mode of trade in that time period. For a very long time, mercantilism, the triangle trade was all we did. So for Thomas to advocating, it makes sense because he's a believer in this colonial idea and this whole belief of working with the mother nation. The part he doesn't say, but which is also means it has to be true, is there's going to be a third part to that little triangle right there. So at the same time, he's advocating for the colony to work with the mother nation. That means there's a requirement to then work with Africa and the slave trade. Yeah. Later on, he doesn't do it directly in this book, but later on, before his death, he would be a proponent of like the Confederacy. By that point, he had 
gone back to England and lived out the rest of his life as someone that nobody really listened to anymore. But right. he was one of those people who was like, yeah, the Confederacy, like they're fighting the good fight because slavery. And you're like, oh my Yay. God. And so, yeah, that's something that has to be dealt with because that's a very real issue with what ends up being the ideas that we get through is that we do do what he says, but we also have to acknowledge that means we're using the other little hidden part that we don't want to talk about right now. Yeah, but it was a part that I think it almost would have been taken for granted for that, for that period, especially for a conservative like Halliburton. He wouldn't have necessarily thought twice about it. That was part of his politics. And he would have considered it probably along the same lines as the Republican sentiments that he saw as brewing in Upper Canada. He would have seen abolitionism as this weird aberration to empire, this weird thing that doesn't fit with his mm -hmm. unified vision of imperialism. And so triangle, that, man. Yeah, exactly. You abolitionists, you're getting rid of our triangle. What are we going to be now? A fucking line? What is this yes. direct trade? What? Well, he makes a big point of it at one point discussing yeah. the how there's a distinct there's a distinction in the slaves between the African slaves and then the white European slaves who are then compensated and treated they're treated better like they're almost not even slaves at that point. Right. They're just I, indentured workers. I think you're talking about the chapter called The White N-Word. I read it in one of the earlier ones too, when he was making this big distinction between the two. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Oh, here it is. Yep. Number 27, the white. And then he writes the word. Oh, well, I'm not even going to bother trying to read any of this out loud by now. So to kind of wrap this all up, I know this kind of sounded like a jumbled mess of a conversation at times, but there's a lot to cover in this book. And honestly, a lot of it is kind of repetitive. At some point, like he, yes. he touches upon the main points over and over again and kind of puts them a, a different spin on them. But this book, so The Clockmaker comes out in 1836 and has all kinds of things to say about Americans, Nova Scotians, the British, you name it, it's there. Do you think that this book still has some value to be read today, right, from a modern audience? I think that we can kind of end with our thoughts on that. What, or is this just a product of its time? of a guy railing against the changes that are happening in the colonies, of a guy that's railing against a Britain that's no longer the Britain that he recognizes. And while it did have an influence on things to come, do you think that today we could read this and still get something out of it? Or do you think it's just a product of its time that we should read as such? I think if you're going into Canadian literature, you should at the very least be familiar with it. I'm happy I am especially as this distinction of being from the first commercially successful, best-selling Canadian author. I think there is some merit to read his works, and this stands out as the most important work to read. And I also think if we're going to keep moving forward in the discussions we have today about how Canada passed and how our history is a jumbled mess of hidden dark shadow stuff, I, it sound, I'm making it sound more ominous, but that's really what it is, Canada's history of this great nation. This is a good book to turn to, to study and say, Look at how this is how our history has been hidden. This is how the darker parts of what makes Canada Canada is being has been stuffed into the shadows, with in the and how it's being celebrated. So I think there's virtue in the times we are in now for this book. Right now is the thing to study and see how it, how much of a tool it is. Almost. Yes. Yeah. For Canadian honestly, propaganda. Yeah. Right. The use of the word tool here is very useful because. While it is disguised as satire, and I think that's one Satire's of the main a tool. Right, exactly. Right, uh, it's it's passed off as this comedy, and I and a type of comedy that has been very popular here in Canada. Uh, and I think that's one of the main reasons why we should keep reading it today, just for its the legacy that it left, kind of creating mm -hmm. our own chronology of dry and very direct humor that still kind of exists in a lot of our comedy today, but. You're absolutely right. That's something that we do need to keep in mind is that this is essentially propaganda, right? It's Thomas Chandler Halliburton's ideas about everything that are packaged into something that's very approachable, mm -hmm. right? And, I mean, that's the best kind of propaganda right there. Right. A Christmas Carol is socialist propaganda and this is Canadian propaganda. <laughs> I mean, 
yeah, there you go. We're social democratic propaganda. Canada in a nutshell. <laughs> well, this is colonial propaganda. Right. Triangle trade. But you, I think you really hit the nail on the head here, regardless of whether you want to look at it and see the kind of things that we've been ignoring in Canada or covering up for too long and see where this stuff comes from and how this thing, how these things, these topics of racism uh, were approached in a book like the clockmaker were seen by higher people in the higher up spheres of government. I think you should read this. And even just from a comedic point of view or from a literary point of view, it's definitely worth a while. Also, even if you, for some reason, don't want to think about the (laughs) racial or political implications of it. Right. Uh, I mean, you should definitely. I, oh, I, yeah. I, yeah, like I, I'm entirely proposing that you should think about the political implications of it. It's very hard not to reading this because it's in case very you much didn't in hear what face. I just did. I made a sound when Patrick said, if, even if you don't want to look into political implications, I made a sound, I made a face. Yeah, the we're on Zoom for discussing this. You should absolutely like this is a discussion that needs to be had. But there are many ways in which you can go about this book, right? That's all I'm mm-hmm. trying to, to, to say. And oh, for sure. It's not the easiest book to approach. One of the other comments that you had sent to me was, this is written in blocks. That there's oh, yeah. no, like, it's not written like a modern novel at all. There's no, oh, yeah. there's no quotation marks for, for dialogue or things like that. There's very little distinction. It's just blocks of text that are funny at times, even though some of the humor kind of doesn't, permeate into our modern sensibilities but it's not an easy book but i think it's one that should be read still if you're making a project of studying literature studying canadian literature and canadian history this is definitely something that should be on your reading list yeah for sure with that being said i think we can end the episode here thank you everyone for listening you can reach out with any questions comments or concerns through the facebook page through twitter by email let us know again like if you prefer this format if you prefer to having two people here to discuss i'd be happy to come back again but if that's not what the people want far be it for me to stand in the way of the people or i might take a halibertonian stance and be like (laughs) no i am the elite here i am the one who decides what i do with my own (laughs) like god that got loud for a second sorry (laughs) uh honestly if you want to hear more of this It might be a bit more structured in future episodes. This was the first time that we've tried this for Mm -hmm. the show. And so we're kind of finding our footing. But I think this was actually a good conversation. I really enjoyed this personally. Same. Yeah. I liked it. So, yeah, if you want to reach out through any of these places, you can with any comments about today or just the show in general. All links are going to be in the description. You can support the show through the coffee page that I set up or through PayPal. I'm working on a Patreon page that I might have some extra episodes. Stay tuned for that, I guess. And I also have an affiliate link that you can check out on the Historia Canadiana website where you'll find all kinds of books relating to what we were talking about in the episode. And if you buy some through there, it will get a kickback to me basically at no extra cost to you. So if you're interested in the books that we were talking about, or just in this case, just the book, you can check out that list. With that being said, thank you everyone again. I'll see you next time on Historia Canadiana. Thank you very much for being here, Mackenzie, and I hope to see you again sometime. Pleasure. Me too. All right. Cheers, everyone.